Um, and it's really nice to have folks receptive to the option of doing these virtually. Um, I'm going to present the session today on, on preparing for an interview. So I'll start by sharing my screen and we'll do some housekeeping while I to get us started. All right, here it is. Here we go. Great. So this session is typically led by a couple of our department chairs. And this year, we just found ourselves with, uh, with folks pretty stretched. And so I'm going to um, uh, lead it today. But I am going to rely a lot on the input that the chairs have provided in the past. And I want to particularly thank Dr. Rosner, um, Dr. Kipnis, Dr. Goodkin, and, a, and a, just a number of our chairs who over the years have been willing to do this session with folks. Um, I uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. We're asking folks to stay muted to limit background noise. But if you have questions, if you can locate the chat icon on the bottom of your screen, that would be the way you'd, you'd uh, submit a question to us. So if you wanted to check it out now, when you move your mouse over the bottom of the screen, you should be able to see it. Many of you all have probably used it already. Um, if the volume seems low, check your own system's volume. Um, and then sometimes we have technical issues that are fixed by people logging out and logging back in. Um, and the whole session is being recorded, so a link uh, to the recording will be emailed soon along with all of these slides. You can expect to receive those. Um, Ashley and Troy are going to be interrupting me with your questions. I'll try to pause from time to time so we can address those. So. Uh, the importance of the annual review. So you can see on this first slide that's relatively blank, the links at the bottom, which are basically the policies at the institution that uh, that require that we do annual reviews. And any, any of you that have been employed in any uh, other profession know that an annual review is just part of, of the routine. And in fact, many places, there's more than one annual review. I would not say that the university, that the university as a whole or the School of Medicine has been great about it, but we've really put some work into it in the past several years. And now we ask your supervisor, so either your division head or your chair, to, to submit an annual review after it's completed each year. And we do, while we don't read those, we pay attention to, to whether they're all submitted. So I think the School of Medicine actually is in a new place in terms of compliance. It's really important for, to make sure that, that everybody's on the same page um, in terms of meeting physician expectations. But what's really important for the faculty is that it's a critical tool for your professional advancement. And another piece of that is, is making sure you talk about advancement at the annual review. Um, it also provides an occasion for self-evaluation. So in the process of getting ready for it, you need to take the time and think about what your past year or years have been like and what the future it looks like. And finally, it's a great opportunity for you and, the cha and your chair to talk about the good work you've done. Although, as, as I'll say later, don't wait until the annual review to broadcast what you've done well. The chair needs to heal that, hear that as it's happening. Um, in terms of lo looking forward, so we've talked about looking back, but in terms of looking forward, the annual review is also a great time to find new ways to use your talents, to, to talk about what your expectations have been and perhaps adjust things. And as your talents are, are, are further developed, how you can use them in different ways. Um, and importantly, it's a time to look for ways to improve and develop. Uh, you know, if there are areas where folks have not met expectations, how do we help them move forward? How do we help them um, have a developmental plan? And then finally, the annual review itself is really the foundation for rewards and recognition. Um, you know, it's a time to talk about being nominated for prestigious Boards. It's critical that we, that a good annual review is done that talks about promotion every year and really then sets you up for a promotion packet to make sure you don't come upon, upon promotion and feel ill prepared because you haven't been doing work all along. And the provost asked that we, when we were doing our merit increase cycle, that we have documented in the annual review the folks who we would give, who how, how we would treat people in the merit increase cycle. The annual review is the foundation for that. It is largely a formative process that. Um, that allows you to set uh, goals for future years, as well as assessing your performance in the three mission. Um, and as I've alluded to in the past slide, it's an opportunity to provide guidance, recognize achievement, and then to look at challenges that may have kept folks from uh, reach, uh, reaching the performance goals they had in mind and, and help you think about how you get around those. Um, 
Now, a few policy related questions. It must be face to face. So if you have, if those of you who've had past evaluations have always done those um, virtually. So a, a piece of paper gets sent back and forth and you work on that. It really does need to be a face to face meeting with the supervisor and the faculty member. Of course, you know, over the coming months, we're going to be doing all of these in this format, in a virtual format. Um, but uh, but you, having some place where you can have that verbal and nonverbal communication or written and verbal communication is, is important. Um, it's not just about numbers. So particularly for clinicians, or, or uh, it can boil down to productivity. For researchers, it can boil down to the number of papers published. But it really sh goes beyond just you know, how many boxes have you checked and how many, you know, what are the numbers for the past year? It needs to be forward thinking, discussion of goals, discussion of accomplishments, and um, importantly, performance relative to expectations. Um, as I already said, but I'll reemphasize this, unless you are a full professor, your progress towards advancement should be discussed with with you every year um, so that we're making sure that the person who's your supervisor is always having that conversation with you are you ready? What does it take to be ready? Um, and, and really encouraging all of us to seek advancement to the rank of professor. Um, and then uh, for, for places where performance isn't meeting expectations, that should be documented. Sometimes performance doesn't meet expectations because your job has changed, and that should be documented as well, so it's, you're not seen as being deficient in some way. But if performance isn't meeting expectations, if you had specific goals around say clinical hours you're going to participate in, uh, number of students you teach, any of those things and, and, and those aren't met, that should be documented. And a performance improvement plan should be put in place to say how we can begin moving you in the direction of, of that performance. Um, and if you have a performance improvement plan, it's important to follow up quarterly with your supervisor to say, how am I doing? Am I moving in the direction that, that uh, I'm expected to be moving so I meet the expectations uh, of my position? So I'm gonna pause and ask Ashley and Troy if there are questions that um, I can answer at this point. I see one chat. Oh, I just see Troy said, feel free to submit questions, but no questions. Does anybody want to raise a hand? You can also do that. Does anybody want to uh, chip in? You can unmute yourself if you have a question you'd like to ask at this point. Hi, Susan. Uh, this is Fran. Hi, Fran. Um, I just wanted to let you know your audio is, is getting a bit garbled from time to time, just, just so that you're aware. Thank you, that's helpful. Maybe I'll slow yeah, down. Usually, uh, no, I just think it's it's the audio connection. Usually, um, I'm not sure if you've called in using a landline. It works much better using that okay. option. Well, let me pause and do that. Um, I'm gonna have to look to see how to do that. Um, yeah, so if you just go, um, um, If you just click by the phone thing on the bottom, on the bottom left. Let me, what I'm going to have to do is end my slideshow to do that. And then here. you have like the video and the mute thing, the phone mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so there. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Okay. Let me do that. Um, Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting. Enter your participant. You are in the meeting now. There are more than 20 participants in the meeting. This meeting is being recorded. Ordered, 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 ordered. Just turn your, yeah, there you go. That work. Yeah, just turn your volume up on your phone. All the way up. Yeah. You have to unmute yourself.
Got it. I had muted my phone. I thought I had muted my computer. All right. Sound good? Yeah, much better here. All right. Let me share again. Are you all seeing my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, perfect. All right, it went back. I know I was on slide six. Great, thanks for that help. Okay, so we've sort of talked about the background around annual reviews. Let's talk about how we actually um, do the process here at UVA and what tools are available to help you. Um, we have we used to have a generic annual review form that could be used for any track, but over the past couple of years, we've customized these tools so that they apply to each faculty track. So the first thing is to know what faculty track you are on, and then you go to the link that you see at the bottom of this page that says uh, the annual review process and forms, and go to the form for your track. Now, one thing I want to say is that these are forms that you you can use, but you're not required to use them. Um, so your department may have adapted the form to some degree, which is absolutely fine, but just know that the components that are important to be discussed in your department uh, are all found in this form. And they all include, you know, talking about the work in the mission area that are appropriate for your faculty track. They ask about progress towards prior year goals. They discuss adherence to aspire values and contributions and service. And these are two things that are really important um, that you pay attention to the, because um, at the time of promotion, your supervisor, your nominating leader, so usually the chair will be asked to attest that you have, are compliant with the aspire values. So it's important that you, that you have that conversation with the chair just to ask, or your supervisor to say, are there any concerns or, or are there any areas I need to work on? Because uh, if a supervisor is not able to attest your adherence to the aspire values, then your promotion and tenure packet is considered incomplete. That's a rare occurrence, but I think it's important to know that that's something is looked at in your packet. In addition, there's also, uh, there should be a discussion of your contributions in service, and that's both institutional service and service to your profession. Um, that is something required by the provost, that all faculty members at, in all the schools contribute in service, um, both institutionally and professionally, uh, in their professional organizations. So that's something, again, to bring up every year to say, what are you doing to have your supervisor, um, whether it's your division chief or your chair, to help you think about ways in which you are contributing in service or could be. And that may be an opportunity for that chair or supervisor or division head to provide you with opportunities, to connect you with places where your skills would be particularly useful to your profession. So keep those two things, the Aspire Values and Service in mind, because those are newer in our annual review, and you may have to, to drive that discussion to quite, a, to, quite a, to quite a degree to make sure it's included. Sue? And finally, it all, yeah. So we have a question actually about the Aspire Values. Uh-huh. What are concrete ways we can demonstrate that we are adherent to Aspire values? So I'm going to refer you to the School of Medicine policies um, because there is a code of conduct in the School of Medicine policies, and you can find the link to that on the on the uh, faculty development pages. And Troy, we can send those out when we send the slides. But it text tells about each of the values: accountability, stewardship, professionalism, integrity, respect, and excellence. So you'll see all of those. You'll see some descriptors um, and some concrete examples uh, there. But please, if you have other questions, why don't, you, why don't you talk to me directly? I'm happy to talk more about it. I, I think, by and large, people are adherent to it. But I think it's good to get the feedback if there are any concerns about um, you know, your, your compliance. Great. And then one other question about service here. Um, what, what does service exactly mean, contributions in service? Yeah, so contributions and service really means, you know, in your department, be, beyond your work in each of the mission areas, 
uh, how are the ways that you help with the functioning of your department? Uh, so what committees might you serve on? Um, you know, are you doing uh, advising of students? But what, what are the pieces that are all, all the work, the infrastructure of the department that you're contributing to so that you're uh, serving as a good citizen of the department? So that's the internal things. And there may be division committees or division work. There may be department work. Um, there may be uh, service line work. There may be medical center work. Um, there may be things in the School of Medicine as a whole. Um, and then in your professional organizations, I mean, in, for promotion of full professor, uh, a, a national and, and uh, as appropriate an international um, reputation is expected. And so in order to develop that reputation, you really have to engage with your colleagues in your profession. And uh, that is frequently uh, obtained by um, being involved in your national organizations. And those national organizations have interest groups, they have um, they have a variety of ways in which faculty members can contribute to their work. And so it really is um, engaging with your, your regional and national peers, um, supporting the work of your profession. And again, there are many, many ways to do that regardless of whether your mission, your primary mission of focus is clinical education or, um, or research. Um, and that's the kind of thing you should discuss with your chair. All of your chairs are involved um, professionally at a national and international level. So getting some information from your chair or division head about he, how she or he built their national reputation and how they're serving nationally is a good way to think about how you develop uh, uh, that part of your, of your portfolio. Great. And then is there um, an exact contribution that's expected from service from assistant to associate for promotion? So service to a professional organization. Yeah, there, there, is an, there are a million ways to, to meet that. And I think, so the, I think what I usually advise people is to think about what are you passionate about. So, for example, if you're passionate about medical student education, could you be involved with you know, with the students throughout the trajectory in medical school, from pre-clerkship to clerkship to electives, you know, are there committees that, that look at the work in all those areas and how could you contribute to those, either as, say, curriculum committee member or a special task force member? Um, so that, that's a way you could institutionally contribute to, to education. Um, and then nationally, most of our professional organizations have, if not a separate organization, a subset of our professional organization that's particularly focused on education. And so, you know, Family Medicine, we have the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine. There are, there's ways to participate in those meetings, to contribute through presentations, to join a task force, say a task force on uh, uh, teaching simulation, that, that would be a committee you could serve on. And the nice thing about those national committees is most of the work is done virtually. Um, so you don't have to spend significant time away from home to do those things, but you really can be engaged and contribute and learn a lot. And that's the other piece of it. This isn't just service to the, um, to the organization. This is really something for your professional development. What I found is those networks that I connect with nationally really influence a lot what we do here. So example, there's a listserv going around right now on one of my national organization that's looking at PNT and how do we streamline getting referee information this year because it's going to be very, you know, people are going to be really busy this year and, and, and more tax and it may be harder for us to get the letters of recommendation that we need for promotion and tenure. So this particular listserv question and information that's going around from my colleagues says, should we be developing a form? Should that become a standard? If we all adopt it, um, protect, perhaps it'll be the standard for this year. So that's, that really helps me think about how I do that work for, for, our col for my colleagues here at UVA. So those are the type of things I'm, I'm thinking about and that I've done that are really helpful. Anything else? That's it for now. All right. Thanks. All right, so I'm going to move on. This is just one of the forms. Um, so you see this is the form for the clinical faculty track. They all start pretty much this way. They ask you to spell out your name and your department and your track and your years on your track. Um, uh, you know, if you don't know what track you're on, if you look, at, look up yourself in Workday, you'll see under the academic uh, 
tab, you'll see your track. I bet most of you do, but if you don't, it also has your hire date. It will have your years and rank. So if you can't remember, I'm sure most, again, most of you remember that stuff, but that, that kind of information wasn't easily available, but it really is pretty accessible in Workday. And so I would suggest you go into Workday, look yourself up, and look at all the information there about you in Workday so you can make sure it's correct. But these forms, we would love at some point to have them available um, as an online fill-in form. Right now, they're really uh, a Word document that you can edit as you wish, but I think there is one for every track, and we'd love your thoughts on how to improve them as you work with them. All right, so let's talk a little bit about best practices as you get ready for your annual review. So I really would say, would suggest that you put aside, put aside some time to really prepare for the annual review so that you are thoughtfully going into it and, and considering um, what you want to have at the end of it, what you want to accomplish. Um, so the first thing I do is say, you know, get the form. Um, Complete the form and the form asks for some documentation. Make sure this is a good time to update your CV, and then you're going to probably cut and paste things from your CV onto the form so it's all in one place for your um, for your uh, your supervisor to review. Um, then you're going to want to make sure that you whoever you're going to meet with has those materials in advance. So I would suggest that when you have a date for your annual review set, you get in touch with the person you'll be meeting with and say. How far in advance of our meeting would you like my form and my CV? Um, so, I, so in some cases, the, the, the reviewer will say, oh, you can just bring them to the meeting. You'd ideally not want that to happen. I'd still send it ahead of time, and I'd send it probably a couple of days ahead of time. Um, but, but, you'd like, you, but you'd like your reviewer to look at the materials in advance so that both you and that person um, have thought about what's on that form and thought about what you want to what you want to talk about, it, and that person is beginning to think about uh, what kind of feedback they're going to give you. You also should think for yourself, what do I want to have come out of this meeting? So what's my agenda? What are my goals for the meeting? And again, that's, the, uh, that's another thing I would send to your supervisor ahead of time. You know, how far ahead would you like to have my form um, and my CV? And then um, saying, I'm going to think a little bit about the things that I'd like to talk about in the meeting and about the goals. Are there any things you want me to be thinking about? So it's really are setting this meeting up to have some real meat and some thought ahead of it. Um, you also should come with your list of questions. If there are things that you don't understand, for example, the question about what is contributions and service, you might say, I know I'm expected to contribute in service, um, and that's going to be expected before my, uh, my next promotion. Can you tell me a little bit about opportunities? Here's what I'm already doing. What uh, other opportunities are there? Um, so coming up with your list of questions that you may send ahead of time as well. But I think giving your reviewer as much information ahead of time and thoughtfully preparing that information um, it is an important way to have a successful annual review. And then when you have that annual review, uh, be sure to talk about your accomplishments and, as I said earlier, don't wait until the annual review to, to tell your chair or your division director what you've accomplished. Paper accepted, abstract accepted, workshop accepted, you know, one of your students receives an award, um, a, a really great outcome related to a patient, um, some funding, all of those things. Let your chair know as soon as you know, because that is a feather in that in his or her cap as well as in your own. And so you really, you don't want them to be surprised hearing it somewhere else. Um, and you don't want them to find up nine months after it happened. So all of these accomplishments of yours are really accomplishments of your chair. So put them all on your form, but may, don't surprise your supervisor with them. They should have already known. Um, then another really important thing is to look at your most recent job description. So maybe it's your annual review from last year, maybe it's your your um, your job offer, but look at that and and look at how your effort was described in that offer letter and say, is that really what I'm doing? And if it doesn't accurately reflect how you're spending your time, you need to do one of two things. You need to either negotiate with your supervisor, how do I get my time aligned more accurately? Or you need to say, we probably need to do an updated job description. And you want to get that on paper. You want a letter at the end of that annual review that says, we discussed your effort allocation. You're supposedly you know, 60% clinical and 40% education, but you're really 80-20. 
um, because all those are important, first of all, to make sure you're rewarded for your accomplishments. So if you're 40, supposedly 40% 40 education but only doing 20, um, th then there may be expectation for that time that you can't meet. But you also want to make sure when you do apply for promotion that when the promotion and tenure committee looks at what you're supposed to be doing, um, it accurately, accurately reflects what you're actually doing. So getting that updated job description is important. And sometimes people let that drift from their hire date until they apply for associate professor. So it's been five years that you're really not doing what you were, what was in your offer letter. And it's, it's hard to, to document how things change if you're not looking at that year by year. So as I said, if there's a mismatch between effort and outcomes um, associated with that effort, also expect a discussion of reallocation of, of effort. So if you've been given 80% time protected to write a book, and I know this is not something we do in our school, so that's why I'm using this. But if you're being in 80% time protected to write a book and there is no book, then you're probably going to have your effort shift. So I think being mindful of that, if, if the time that you were given to do some work uh, didn't pan out in an outcome that was associated with it, um, you may be given a performance improvement plan or you may have a reallocation uh, of effort. And then finally, uh, that in the, in the um, annual review, it's a great time to talk about things you want to do next. Um, and I think it doesn't mean you'll necessarily, necessarily make that change that year, but for example, if you're in um, a clinical department and want to become uh, a program director for the residency program or fellowship director, you might put that out and expect and talk about how do I move along that path so that in two to three years I can be in that role. So maybe I'm an associate program director for a couple of years, but really talking about this is where I'd like to see myself go putting it out with your supervisor, and if the supervisor agrees that's a path they'd like to help you take, begin the, the formative process of getting you from where you are now to that. But really thinking about what do you want to do next and thinking about um, how do I begin that journey to that new role, which often will take a couple of years, but, but putting it out there is really helpful. I'm going to pause a second, see if there are any questions about that. Yes, there um, are a few questions that have come in. Um, is there a, a CV template? Um, there's one for P&T. Is there one specific to the annual review? There is not one specific to the annual review. Um, the AAMC, so Ashley and Troy will make notes about things to send out. The AAMC does have a CV template, um, which is uh, not the one for P&T. It's a little more streamlined. So we can send a link to that if you'd like to see that template as well. Okay. Um, a comment that says, we often get verbal feedback from patients. How do we get that in writing, i.e. a format that can go up to our supervisor? That's a great question because, of course, you want to capture that. Um, I, I think one of the things you can say to the patient is, uh, you know, thanks so much for giving me that verbal. verbally. You will get an opportunity to provide feedback on our visit today because we do get um, pa patient satisfaction surveys are sent out. And you could say, you know, it would be really meaningful to me if you filled out that survey and specifically made those say, same comments on the survey. So I think that's the way the data can get to you and then can be accessible for things like P&T. Um, Another comment here, question. <clears throat> when one is updating the allocation of effort, at what level does it become formal? At the end of the annual review on the form or an updated job description? So ideally you complete the annual review, the chair signs off for the supervisor, you sign off, and I would at that point say, you know, that's the point at which you should get a, a, an, annual, a, an updated job description. And usually we think of our academic year as July 1 to June 30th, so I would expect that it would change then. But sometimes things change mid-year. In fact, you may get an updated uh, job description that happens middle of the year because, you know, something happened, you got moved into a different role. And so I, I think... I think whenever your job significantly changes, I would ask for you that it be memorialized in a written document right away. Um, and by right away, I mean within a few weeks. Um, if you, taking on a big shift in duties and not having it documented um, has, ha, is a missed opportunity in many ways. So um, 
I think, getting it on paper. But certainly if it's negotiated at the annual review, I'd ask to have that letter accompanying the final. You, you're, you're the final sign-off on it, so I would ask before you sign off on it that you get that updated job description. Um, and then just to clarify about the CV, there's no template that's required for the annual review in terms of the CV, but the P&T has an expectation around the CV format. Yes, that's exactly right. And so um, many of you, I'm sure, are like me in that you see CVs from people all over the country all of the time. I think the AAMC template is a nice one to use because it is available as a national template. But I've seen some beautiful CVs that don't follow that template exactly. But I think the nice thing about the AAMC template is it's very complete. Um, it tells you what to put on the CV and what not to put on the CV, some of those things. But I, I think it's a really good idea to get into a habit um, wherever you are in your career right now of making sure your CV is uh, adhering to those types of guidelines that you see on the AAMC site. And then a couple more questions that have come in. <clears throat> How does the P&T committee view program director slash associate program director roles. It seems there's more emphasis on medical student involvement than with residency or fellowship. Actually, that's not true at all. Program director, associate program director are both really significant contributions in education. The important thing about PNT though is for you then, for every part of your portfolio, you write a personal statement. And when you write that personal statement, you talk about your impact in that role. So how is, how is serving in that role of program director, associate pro program director, how does that demonstrate excellence in education? But those are very significant roles that, that the PNT committee, um, but, but they don't just consider it as a, as a line on your CV. You need to expound on what that involves, what you've done, innovative things, outcomes associated with you in that role. Because of course you can do the role really well. I'm sure everybody on this call does, but Sometimes people are, are, are not doing uh, the things, uh, are not necessarily um, pushing the role and, and, and taking advantage of that opportunity to really have an influence on the trainees. And then uh, finally, is, is there a contact that um, faculty need, need to be able to make sure that a patient actually gets a mailed survey? Or do those go out? We should probably look into that. I... I, I know every time I see, I'm see i seeing at UVA, I get a, a, a survey, a Prescani survey, but I'm not sure if every patient gets every survey or whether it's just a sampling. So I, I think we can look into that as one of our homework from this call is to say, it, do they go to everyone? If they do not go to everyone, how can you, you know, who can you submit a name to to make sure a specific patient gets a survey? So thanks for asking that question. We'll look into it. All right, I'll go on to the next slide. So we want to talk about some um, questions you may ask yourself as you're preparing for the annual review to really spur the thoughts about what I want to ask for next, what I want to set as goals. And so the first one I always think is, what do you enjoy about your work? Um, you know, we talk a lot about burnout, um, and there's been quite a bit of uh, literature about burnout in academic medicine and in healthcare in general. And Tate Shanafelt, who used to be at Mayo and now is at Stanford, has done probably the most work on it nationally. And, and some of the work that Tate and his group, Lottie Derby is another person who's done it, and Lottie was here not that long ago, um, found is that uh, when, you're, when you can spend 20% of your time doing work that you really enjoy, um, that's really protective of burnout. So I would think about your work week and, and think about, you know, if your work week has some cadence to it that you do similar things on different days, what's your favorite work day um, or your favorite half days? And think about do I, you know, what are the things I most love to do and do I get to do those things as much as a, the equivalent of a full day a week? Because that really helps you think about, um, you know, what do you enjoy? And if you're not doing it 20% of your time, how might you do more of it? If you're doing it 20% of your time and there are ways you could see doing it 40% of your time, how might you negotiate for that change? So I think really thinking about what you enjoy is great. Um, uh, I almost got in trouble there. I pushed a phone button instead of my mouse. I'm getting, I'm getting too absorbed in this. Um, then how would you describe your level of satisfaction? So, you know, are you happy here? Do you enjoy your work? I mean, 
certainly work is taxing, but do you in general find your work stimulating? Do you, you just, you know, I love to think. And so it's really great to have a job where you think all the time. I like to problem solve as well. So I love a job that throws problems at me over and over again. Um, but uh, people like different things. That, and are you satisfied with what you get to do? Um, what are the good and bad things about your job, which obviously trying to think how do you build up the good and how do you eliminate the bad? What are your own strengths and weaknesses? You know, there was a time when I think we really felt that we should evaluate everybody's strengths and opportunities and try to make everybody strong in everything. Well, I, I think that we, the, the, the literature looking at that finds it's really impossible. And what we really need is a diverse team that uh, – has, that has all the strengths that we really need among the team members. And so what are my strengths when I'm on a team and how do I find opportunities to really use those strengths and contribute the good of my team and my organization? And what are my weaknesses that at least I can mitigate or I can say I know some particular part of me is a weakness and so let's not take on roles where it's going to it's going to put stress me out because I'm asked to perform at a high level in an area where I know I just innately do not. Um, then thinking about how um, how do you think you did in achieving your goals you set for yourself last year and be really be as objective as possible about those. Um, when you think about these, where in what areas did you excel and what areas do you need to improve? Um, and then what are challenges and obstacles you faced in reaching those goals? And certainly we're all going to look at these several months that we're going through with uh, the, with the the distances we have from each other and the disruptions in our work, you know, what that's certainly going to be a challenge and an obstacle, but we're all going to learn things during this time that we wouldn't have known any other way. And so uh, uh, thinking about how to use that information is important. And then finally, uh, thinking about what are your goals for the coming year and then um, how would you how how will you describe your progress? In, in other words, what are the milestones as you think about meeting those goals? How are you gonna how are you gonna break them down into components over the course of the year? And then some questions you might ask of your supervisor. And Mitch was really helpful in giving us these questions. Um, you know, he 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 finds it really helpful for the faculty member to ask, what areas should I focus on to be a stronger care candidate for promotion or for leadership? Um, you know, do you have advice about strengthening any part of my portfolio? So as the, the supervisor looks at the work you've done, what advice, how can I uh, balance it? Are there places where it's unbalanced and where I'm putting too much work? And we all tend to work in the areas where, where it's easy for us, but, you know, where might I uh, rebalance things a little bit and focus on some other areas? Um, am I prioritizing my activities right? Um, and, and how might you suggest I reprioritize to get get to accomplish things that you expect of me. Um, and then really that part about reputation, building your reputation. Am I making progress towards building those? And if not, how can I, um, how can I make that progress? And then finally asking, is there somebody else I should be talking to? Is there someone you think you, I should be connected to um, either as a, a, a second mentor or as a team of mentors, but really how do I expand my horizons either internally or externally to help me be more successful? I'm going to stop there again, um, see if anything so can come a, up. Yeah, a comment came in um, that you might want to respond to, uh, that faculty members generally want to present their strongest selves when being, uh -huh. being evaluated. So there may be some reluctance in bringing up struggles or weaknesses in the setting of a formal evaluation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, this is a formative process, and so I think, and this with your supervisor to say, here's where I need help. Um, I think I wouldn't hesitate if you're if you're concerned about uh, how you will bring things up in that um, in that uh, setting. There are a couple things you could do ahead of time to rehearse to some degree. You could have a trusted colleague or your mentor. You can sit with a trusted colleague or your mentor and say, you know, here's what I'm thinking about. Um, here's something I want to bring up. Can you help me think about a safe way to talk about it, um, a, a way that my that I can present that 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 um, what's even language I can use to talk about my not necessarily my weaknesses, but my areas where I really like to grow. So as as opposed to saying, you know, I know I'm a lousy presenter, and you know how the heck am I going to get better saying, 
you know, I really see that there are opportunities for me to become a pre better presenter. And, you know, are there ways you think I could do that? How could you help me? Are there professional development? Are there low-risk things where I could begin to practice? So really thinking about your weaknesses as presenting them as areas of growth. Um, and if you feel really concerned about something, we have a great faculty and employee assistance program. And the folks there will meet with you. I mean, they'll, they'll do up to – They'll do five or six sessions to really coach you through some of these things that you're a bit concerned about bringing up with your supervisor, but really can, you can get, get great benefit if you talk through them during the annual review. But FEEP would be a good at helping, at listening to you, help you reframe your presentation so that you really can go in confidently and using language that's going to present you as someone who's seeking growth, not somebody who's worried about um, uh, deficiencies. And one of the things I talk to folks all the time about is in the promotion portfolio, people worry about submitting um, uh, evaluations from trainees that are not so good. So early in your career, my, tr my teaching evaluations weren't very good, and I put a lot of work into it, and I, they got a lot better. Um, so should I just put in a good one? And my answer is absolutely not. If you are able, able to say, I was not so good at the beginning, and I worked with this coach and with the Teaching Resource Center and these variety of things, and, and I got to this point, that is outstanding. Standing, um, that someone put in the, the work to develop professionally and was able to improve. So really improvement is, you know, uh, you know showing that it, it, how far you've come is a great thing to be able to demonstrate in every aspect uh, of your work. Uh, All right. One more question I'm just came in. On. Do you think oh. some elements could be best addressed in a separate mentorship realm and left out? of the formal evaluation process? Um, so I'm going to say, I'm going to ask if that the person submitting that question might give us a little more detail. And I'll, I'll go ahead and go on and we'll come back to it. But, but I think I'd love to hear what, uh, what you're thinking of if you're comfortable so that we can talk about it a little more. Because I think the answer is probably yes, but in some cases, no. So let me let that person take a minute. Unless you really yeah, this is Chris from Cartney. I, I submitted that. I've, it's something I've been thinking about. I, um, there are some faculty members who are quite reluctant and intimidated by the hierarchy they find themselves in. And I, my view is that some have real struggles bringing up stuff like that that they think are really important, but um, they're just mortified at bringing it up with uh, their boss. The, the evaluation is pretty high stakes um, in many ways, and so it, it makes it um, difficult for some. Now, some are fine, and they'll bring up anything, um, but as a card-carrying introvert, I thought I'd speak for other introverts um, in posing that kind of question. It's just something I thought about. Could it, um, while I agree that, that uh, sponsorship and mentorship are all critically important, sometimes mixing them in with a formal high-stakes evaluation can be difficult. Yeah. So Chris, I appreciate your comment. I, I have to say I'm a card carrying introvert as well. And talking this long totally exhausts me, except for I love this topic. So, um, but the, the one thing I would say as a counter to that is the supervisor probably already knows the areas where the person needs to grow. And so, um, for you as a person participating in the annual review, if there's something you're afraid to share with your supervisor, they probably already know where there's area where you need to grow. And so I think reframing that with the help of a mentor or sponsor to say, how do I put this out in a way that acknowledges I'm at this place and I'm hoping to grow to this place? Um, because what you're going to be asking for is the resources to help you uh, uh, accomplish that growth. And so that's why I think it's really important to be talking to um, the person who's really got the resources at his or her disposal to help with that growth. growth. So I totally acknowledge how different that is. And I certainly know um, as, there's introversion or extroversion aside, making yourself that vulnerable in front of the, the person at the top of the hierarchy is tough. And yet this is your opportunity to say, here's where I am. You know, I'm great in all these places, but here's where I am with this one thing. And I want to go here. Um, can you help me get there? Um, 
here's where I'm thinking I might do it, but what am I not thinking of? So thanks again. Okay, we'll keep moving. Um, so after the annual review, um, we've alluded to this quite a bit, but talk about what's needed to meet and exceed expectations. So not just what I need to meet expectations, but if you say, you know, uh, to exceed expectations, I will need a little more time, I'll need to attend this conference, you know, put out some of the things, your, your goals and then your stretch goals and what might, what might, you might need to achieve those things. Doesn't mean you'll get them. But I think thinking about those things, um, you know, it, it, and having that conversation, if you're suggesting I can exceed my expectations in this arena with X, and that's an area where the chair really needs that, that work done, the chair may be able to offer you things that are beyond what you would typically ask for. So think about what's expected and what, what would help me go beyond that. Um, you do really want to finalize the documentation, and so what should happen is you have the conversation, but that not sh shouldn't be the end. I mean, sometimes it's, okay, signed here, it's over. Ideally, you've had the conversation. Um, the supervisor the, and you both record your thoughts. Um, you, the supervisor sends to you a document with a summary of what was discussed, um, and you sign off on those. And if you see stuff in there that you don't agree with or you want to correct, that's your opportunity to do so, but it's really, this is your agreement of what's gonna happen the next year, and so there would be some back and forth. And so I was a department chair for a year and a half and went through one round of annual reviews, and it can take some time to do the back and forth, but it's really important because in that conversation, you both might not hear things the same way, and I think it's really good to clarify it so that you're not, a year later, um, talking about an expectation that, w that you didn't realize was there. Um, then, uh, once you've set those things um, and you secured those resources, then uh, set milestones. Uh, as I said a little bit earlier, you know, what are all the things that you're going to do um, and how are you, put yourself on a timeline. I try to print out my goals for the year and have them in front of me and updating them and, and I am not an organized person, so for me to do that is difficult. But setting milestones and providing updates, at, at least your own updates to yourself. But if this is a high stake thing, uh, program or uh, exercise for your leader, providing that leader with those your progress updates is great. Um, you know, follow up with discussions as needed. If you're setting milestones and you're providing updates and you're finding obstacles, I think talking to your supervisor before the next annual review about. You know, uh, I, I don't know, think, I think, you know, we're not going to meet this milestone because of X, Y, or Z. That's an important thing to share with your supervisor so that that supervisor, A, isn't surprised at the annual review, and B, if there are obstacles he or she can help you get around, um, they would want to know that. They wouldn't want to be surprised about, about that. All right. Um, I'm going to shift to annual review and academic advancement um, because, as I said, it's important expect to discuss it every year if you haven't reached the rank of full professor. If your supervisor doesn't bring it up, you should bring it up. You should bring it up with a full understanding of what's going to be important for you to accomplish to make your next jump and then talk about how you're doing with meeting those criteria um, and what steps you, you'll need to take and also needed resources. So if you realize, you know, there's this one area, like I, you, I feel like my service is kind of weak really talk to your supervisor, and after talking to your mentor or your sponsor or several people, talk about your plan for that, so that really the benefit of that is also the supervisor, when that, your, that person comes to writing your nomination letter, knows you've paid attention to this all along. You've really been committed to all aspects of your of, uh, of being able to advance. And then there are some folks who realize um, that they're not on the right track, so, um, you know, the other advantage of being aware of your track and being aware of what's required to advance in your track is at some point you may look at that and say, this is not what I'm doing um, or, or nor, nor what I want to do. It may have been when I took my position, but it's no longer true. Track changes are, are, are very possible. Um, and we do, you know, I'm meeting with the dean after this meeting. Um, one of the things we'll talk about is a request for a track change. People tra change tracks all the time, and there are nuances to how you change tracks and what things are different. I'm always happy to discuss that. But do always keep in mind, am I on the right track? Does this look like the job um, that I am doing, and are the things required for me to advance in this track 
aligned with what I'm doing? And if not, have a conversation about changing track. And do that at any point, but certainly the annual review is a good time to do a gut check on that. And then the annual review, again, at any time you can discuss a time off the clock, but the annual review, again, is a good time to do a gut check around, um, you know, have I had some obstacle come up in, in the past year that, that's going to slow my, or going to delay my ability to advance on the clock if you're on a track that's on the clock. And if so, um, talking about time off the clock is possible. Um, and I want to do one aside about off the clock, and, and because this is my last slide before questions, more questions and comments. Um, during this time, uh, our lives are very disrupted professionally. Um, and right away, one of the first things that I and the dean started talking to the provost about is, um, you know, should we be granting everyone a year off the clock to account for what is going to be many months of disruption of our lives. Um, that conversation has now been going on with the provost and with all of the schools at the university for several weeks. And I think there will be a decision made within the next week and there'll be an, I expect we'll get a communication from the provost. All of this is what I think is gonna happen in terms of the communication, but I feel very confident that we will be able to extend the clock for everyone on a clock by a year. Um, and ideally, and I think this is what will happen, it will be automatic. So you won't have to request it. You don't have to take the year off. If you're ready to go, you can go up on, on time. But I think people on the clock should know that um, th th we, everyone understands how difficult this current time is for their academic progress and want to give people the breathing room um, and not have to go through the process of requesting the time off the clock. So I just wanted to put that out there. All right, and no more slides from me, just time for questions and comments and thoughts. So I don't see any new questions or comments that have come in. Sue, this is Siobhan. How are you? Thanks Good. for doing this. Um, Sue, I had a question about, um, this goes back to one of your early slides where you're mentioning the Aspire um, values. When we're getting, when we're sending out requests to referees, um, well not, so sorry, let me rephrase that. I, we are not sending out referee requests, but when we are receiving um, requests to write for other people, would it be helpful to speak directly to the Aspire values if we know this colleague uh, within UVA? So it certainly doesn't hurt. The only place we require a statement about Aspire values is in the nominating letter. So we okay. ask the chair to comment and we say a simple sentence saying that the person, uh, you know, it, it demonstrates Aspire values. That's all that's required. However, it's certainly wonderful if other people can bring it up and you're, you're right, the internal referees are most likely to bring it up because they're aware of the Aspire values and the requirements, so. Thanks. Thank you. There's a, a question that's come in. Um, off, we often don't discuss finances in medicine. How does a junior faculty member negotiate keeping on par with AMC salary for their specialty if not already at that benchmark? Yeah. Um, and then there's a follow-up. So I'll let you respond to that and there's a follow-up. Okay, so the first thing I would say is it is worth at that com during the course of your annual evaluation asking your chair how do you determine the salaries and the merit increases in our department? Is there a benchmark you use for us? Or for example, do you pay, you know, you start everybody at the 35th percentile and expect you'll go to the 65th before promotion? Kind of ask the chair, because the departments all have a compensation plan. Um, so I think asking your chair about that. Now, ideally the chair is talking to the department about that in other ways, um, but if you don't know what your department's compensation plan, I think just saying I'm curious about the, the, the business of medicine and wondering um, what the compensation plan is in our department. Um, I think also through um, sh the SharePoint site, um, and there's a link from, from the faculty development page, you can look at the AAMC salary tables um, and we get a special report every year, and, and the 2019 report just was put up about you know, seven or 10 days ago. Um, and you will see your specialty broken down by the fifth percentile, so you can see 
what your, you know, where your salary is benchmarked. And it, it gives you base compensation, one set of tables around base compensation, and a second set of ta tables about total compensation. So you can look at that, and you can go to the chair and say, I can see that I'm getting paid at the 95th percentile, thanks a lot. Or I'm getting paid at the 5th percentile, what's the deal? Um, but you can look at that, and what the chair may say is, I know you're getting paid at the 30th percentile, so is everyone in the department, um, and that is not the goal of the institution, and we're moving in the direction of moving everybody to this point, and I'll keep you posted on that. But absolutely, you should, everybody should, um, yeah, everybody should. You should know and you should have that part of the conversation because unfortunately, um, not asking doesn't guarantee that automatically someone will say, it's time to ratchet this person up. And so I think it's really important. And the merit increase cycle, which is the change in base pay, happens in the summertime. So having that conversation during the end review keeps it front of mind for your supervisory chair as we go into the merit cycle. Great, and then um, a follow-up to that was, um, many of us have an RVU component to our salary. So during the COVID pandemic and the months long impact, RVU, RVU metrics uh, may be completely thrown off. How do we account for the financial aspects and productivity? Yeah, I mean, I, I think to be, to, to be honest, as we all know, this, this the COVID crisis is terribly expensive for everyone in this country, including our institution. Um, so I think any, any of our planning around compensating people for, for anything, I mean, all, it's all going to go out the window. I, I have an RVU component as well. You know, my typical half day in clinic teaching with the residents, I'll see a dozen patients. Last week I saw one, yesterday I saw four. It's, it's just so disrupted. So I think I would take a, a pause on that and know that we just don't know when it's going to end or how we're going to come out on the other side. I mean, I think it's, I don't mean to frighten people, but I think it's realistic to say the finances, the, the old rules are not going to apply and we don't know what, what the, the new temporary rules, but what the new rules are going to be that apply to this year. And I think we're going to have to remove um, any productivity uh, expectations that are beyond people's control and, and so many things are. So I haven't heard that discussion at, at an institutional level, but we all know our productivity is way, way down because we're making space for folks who may need hospital beds. Great. And then just to confirm that salary um, report that you referenced, the WMC benchmark, um, that's available on our website. We can include a link uh, to the SharePoint site. Right. You have to get into SharePoint. It's it's on not the it's a different website. So it's so you have to go through a series of steps so that you can get onto SharePoint. It's a different password and a variety of things. Once you're set up, you're good. But it's a it's a little bit uh, it's a different process. So um, take some time. Have a little patience as you figure it out because it's not a, it's, it's a university website, not ours, not an HSCS. Sue, this is uh, Alyssa Trubridge. I just have a quick question because I think I missed it. Currently, the CVs that the School of Medicine recommends as far as a template, does that meet or is So the one that's on, this, on our P&T site is the one recommended for promotion and tenure. So it's going to want, for example, for all your publications to say, you know, rank, uh, the, the impact fang, factor, the rank of the journal, if you're a middle author, explain your role. That's not what you would have on your typical CV. So it's more detailed than a typical CV. And so the AAMC one is, uh, does not have all of that, all those, all, does not re request all that information that the P&T committee does wish to see. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one more, a couple more questions came in. When is an average time for assistant professors to be thinking about applying for promotion? Mm -hmm. And so if you're on a tenure track, you must apply for associate professor at the end of your fifth year. So as you're winding down your fifth year, you submit for promotion. Um, if you're on a non-tenure track, that's a, a you, you can't be promoted till the end of your sixth year, but that means you'd be applying at the same time. And that's that. I mean, I think if you're having the conversation with your 
chair or supervisor every year, I think at the end of the fifth year, you probably should be ready. Um, so, and so at, at, in the School of Medicine, from assistant to associate, regardless of track, it's typically at the end of the sixth year. Um, if you're on a tenure track, it's at the end of four more years, so at the end of your 10th year that people typically achieve tenure. Um, and then once you're tenured, it's typically two to four years before your full professor, so 12 to 14 years total. If you're tenure ineligible, the same time frame is probably appropriate, just with six years between assistant and associate and six more between associate and full. Um, but you've got to be paying attention every year and looking at your trajectory and saying, am I, am I on track and what what things might I need to work on a little bit. And then do you have advice for who to ask for uh, external referees? That's a great question because I didn't, it's a great question because I didn't answer it earlier and I should have, but um, as you're developing your national and international rotation, and again, I'm a family doctor. I don't have an international ro reputation and I won't other than some of my publications being used nationally. But many of, the, of you who are in research, uh, particularly academic investigators and clinical investigators are gonna have an international reputation. So the point of that being your involvement in those national uh, and international, in, in your national and international organizations are the places to begin meeting folks who can speak to your reputation. And so while I mentioned that you can be involved in a service component in those organizations without necessarily being away from home, you develop relationships in all of those things. So if you're going to a meeting and presenting a poster and someone comes and talks to you um, and is really interested in your work, write down that person's name. Maybe follow up with an email saying thanks for interest. Stay connect with those folks. But it's really the folks who you meet um, through national meetings, through either presentation of your work or service on committees that you develop a relationship with. And those are the people who are much more like, who are, are likely to respond to requests for referee letters. So I would say build your community of folks in your professional group, locally, regionally, nationally, through your connections, through professional service or professional meetings, and keep track of those folks as folks who can write your letters. Um. And then uh, are there any institutional plans um, talking about um, to ensure that faculty will be given supplemental income um, to account for the decline in productivity? So going back to this uh, issue about the RVUs and COVID. Yeah, I don't know of any. I, I'm not. I'm. I'm not in conversations involved in conversations right now to talk about that. So I think if those concerns you should bring to your chair and ask, ask your chair, um, you know, kind of let them know it's on your mind and, and uh, ask him or her what they've heard. I don't know, I don't, I'm, I'm sure it's on people's minds, but I haven't heard of conversations about exactly what plans might be. And is there a time that it's too early to apply for assistant to associate? Um, people do go up what's called early. Um, I think going up two years ahead of, uh, well, for, for tenure and eligible tracks, you can't go up early. You have to have a certain amount of time and rank to apply. Tenure eligible track, going up a year early um, is probably as much as you are able to do um, and, and really meet the requirements of the track. So it's really about what's required for promotion. The bar isn't raised if you go up early, but you really have to make sure you've met the bar. Um, and then going, and the trouble with going up early from assistant to associate is the bar then between associate and tenure is, is higher. And so um, you really have to be on a very steep trajectory in that first jump. Um, be ready three years later to get to associate and have made it, but it doesn't look like they're on significant, uh, a significant enough trajectory to then get tenure, apply for tenure three years after they've achieved associate. So you achieve associate at the end of or whatever, then you only have four years to achieve tenure. So you've got to apply after three years. Okay, great. That's all the questions that I see on here in the chat. If anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, you're welcome to. We've got a little more time. Hi again, it's Siobhan. Um, I have a question. If Should we keep the same referees that we've used in previous steps or for other letters if we've gone up for awards or other positions outside of UVA? Or is that insulting to them to then 
you're like, gosh, this person won't leave me alone. It, can you speak to that? Yeah, so Siobhan, you're asking if, if someone has served as your um, referee for your first promotion, yeah. should you ask them again? And, um, I and, and also, um, you know, for awards, awards if they yeah, you for things awards, that have been more recent as well. Yeah, you know, the nice thing is those folks can take the letter they've already written and retool it and update it. So the truth is it's not that hard for them. And what it suggests to them is you really consider them a valuable sponsor and, and you know, you, uh, you know, you appreciate their, their attention to your success. So I think re, resubmitting those names, uh, if, particularly if it's someone who you, you know, one good practice is after your first promotion, you write a letter to everyone who is your referee. You don't know who's the respondent, but you write to everybody and said, I don't know whether you responded or not, but I listed you as a referee. I just wanted you to know, hear the good news. I was promoted. Thanks so much. Blah, blah, blah. And then that person is, you know, is now um, shared, shared in your success and helped contribute to your su success and certainly would most of the time be more than happy to help with your next application. So it is fine to reuse names, um, but I think it is, it helps a little if you circled back to all your referees and said, you know, either referees or nominators for awards and said, um, you know, thanks for your support or, uh, and you know, here's what I accomplished or here's what I received. Great. Thanks. Sure. Thank you all very much for participating. Please feel free to contact me directly. Also, if you had questions that come up later or that you didn't think about, get to ask during the session, I'm always happy to talk with you. Um, Fran, thanks for the hot tip on the phone because I was doing interviews for a department chair last night and people couldn't hear me, which I couldn't understand. But I think when it's a big group, well, for whatever reason, this seems to work much better. So I will adapt that as a new practice. We're all adapting lots of new practices. I hope we're together face-to-face -face soon. Um, but until then, thanks for everything everyone is doing to get us through this. Um, your continued participation is really important. It's known and acknowledged um, what we assume you're doing, and I'm sure there's much you're doing that we're not even aware of. So don't hesitate to be in touch. If there's anything I can do to help you, um, any advice you need, I'm always happy to to be together, even virtually. So, and thanks to Troy and Ashley for making this possible. Thank you, Sue. Sure.